saw it. Oh dear. <laughs> Can I leave the meeting? Is that an option? No. <laughs> um, I thought we'd use these Wednesday nights here as an opportunity to go through some slides about Bible prophecy. And before I start with this particular uh, set of slides that I've got, it's some most from Vancouver will have seen many of these slides. I've changed it around a bit for tonight. But we're going to use these once a month Wednesday meetings to run through a number of different Bible prophecy um, topics. And it's, it's, it's something I want to introduce a little or, or maybe teach some people or, or point out. Um, Sister Anne mentioned about the events of last year, and that's um, it's been 12 months since the Lord brought us into fellowship with one another, 12 months this week. And and the events that have unfolded have been nothing short of miraculous and blessed, and, and nothing but blessed and miraculous, and that's been a joy. Um, what I'll have explained and mentioned before is it wasn't just two fellowships joining together. It was the Lord rejoining the fellowship that was once one. And... Um, some may have been aware or involved in or, or seen Pastor Jock's history, but going all the way back to 1941, our fellowships were all joined all the way up to 1972. But in 1941, there were two men in particular that the Lord brought together in a sleepy little town in Ballarat in Victoria, Australia. Those two men were Leo Harris and Tom Foster. Now, of course, the history of revival goes way back beyond that, but just to bring it into more semi-recent times. Leo Harris, at the time, he was, he, he was spirit-filled. He spoke in other tongues. But as with the majority of Pentecostal movements all the way up through till today, they didn't have a clear understanding of Bible prophecy. And that distortion of their idea of Bible prophecy originated from the Church of Rome, coming up with an interpretation of the book of Revelations all the way back in the late 1500s. A Jesuit priest called Francisco Ribera came out with this interpretation of Revelations that took the heat or the pressure off the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I can't go into all the history and the details, but in 1941, these two men were brought together by quite a determined lady, um, Miss Fis Finlayson, her name was. She sort of grabbed these two men and forced them to sit down together and talk. Tom Foster, Leo Harris. Leo Harris, as I said, spirit-filled, understood that, and, and was preaching. At the time, he was only 21 years old. Leo Harris, uh, sorry, Tom Foster, a bit older. He was 32, a bit older. Um, he was not spirit-filled, but he had a very clear understanding of Bible prophecy. The Lord brought these two men together, and that really is where you get the, the very unique vision and, and clear vision that the Lord has given to our fellowship. And it's shared. It's, a, it's the same vision that we all have, because it all originated from the same foundation that the Lord put together. So it's going to be a joy going through these slides. I've already used up a bunch of time, so I'm going to have to keep moving or we'll, I guarantee you, we won't be here all night. <laughs> um, in Over the next six or so months, we're going to look at most of these topics, not necessarily in this order. Um, on their own, in their own right. But I just thought to go through a time scale of what the Lord mapped out um, over the last, particularly the last 6,000 years. So a bit of a wide time scale. Um, we'll look at the last days. There is prophecies in the Bible, particularly in Revelation, about the rise of Islam and its involvement in God's judgment in the earth. Um, the role of the Church of Rome and how God views the, the Roman Catholic Church, certainly not a, anything against Roman Catholics as such, but the system of religion it represents. Um, Russia's particular role in the unfolding of events as, as things go forward, 
the Battle of Armageddon that um, is on the minds and lips of more people now than I've ever known in my lifetime. Um, I think the doomsday clock has been moved closest to midnight than it ever has in the history of its creation in recent times. Um, and, and so even the world without a knowledge of Bible prophecy can identify what's ahead. The Bible does it far clearer and gives reasons to why. And the Lord's revealed that to the church and it's incredibly interesting. And, and look, we can use this in our witness and testimony because we are able to give people hope in the gospel and perspective about the future of this world and the only way to escape the coming dilemmas that are, that are going to compound. Um, after the Battle of Armageddon, there are scriptures that indicate God's judgment will come upon sinful man and then Christ will return. And really, we're all looking forward to, to this section, but there's some rocky roads and storms to, to occur in between. Now, one thing is for certain, and I always point this out, uh, no one knows the hour, the day or the hour when the Lord is going to return. No one does. Anyone says that they do, they don't know the Bible and they haven't really got, got any understanding. So we're not here to predict times, timelines with, with any particular accuracy other than to, than to identify the signs that Jesus gave. But one thing that was given, we read this in Thessalonians, it says, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So whilst it may, these events will catch the world by surprise, it won't catch the church by surprise. And that's because for decades, many decades, the Lord has given to the church a very clear picture of Bible prophecy. And it's very important to the message that we have for the unsaved and for the world and will continue to, to grow in its importance as events unfold. So it's important we know it or, or at least have a bit of an understanding of it. I have this... Um, this chart just in my office actually it's just up there on the back wall I don't know if you can see it it's all framed up up the back there um god's great week it basically sections off the last six thousand um years so if i just summarize it if we take the fall of adam as the start point and there's a time scale that historians use called the am scale calendar um if we use that as a start point now, we know the Bible records when Adam fell in the book of Genesis. We don't know how old he was when that happened, how long he'd, be, he'd been on the earth. We don't know, right? Um, Noah comes on the scene. Again, these are very, very rough sort of time scales, um, a bit after a thousand years later. Okay. Then around 2000 years later, we have Abraham comes on the scene, just to give you an idea of the time scale that, that we're looking at this evening. Um, around 3,000 years after the fall of Adam, we have King David. And again, these are very loose dates, right? They're not specifically to the, to the day, it just gives you an idea. Um, Christ's first coming, when we read of it there in the Gospels, um, was 4,000 years after the, the fall of Adam. And there are parables or parallels in the New Testament um, that, that tie in with these timescales too. Lazarus and the time that it took Jesus to get there, um, other things we could look at. The last days. You'll see here, you, you might notice, well, hang on a minute, why is it 4,031? Well, really the, the, the clock started ticking on the gospel age, when not when Jesus was born, but when Jesus died and rose from the dead, when the, when the power of the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost, that was the beginning of the gospel age. The, the, the 2,000 years of the gospel age, roughly, in a, in a prophetic sense. So I'm not suggesting that the Lord's going to come back 
<laughs> exactly 2000 years after his, his um, death and resurrection. Not saying that. It's not a, again, these are rough sort of time scales, just so you're clear. The Battle of Armageddon, again, the Bible indicates that the, the approximation of the time scale is about 2000 years after the, the um, death and resurrection of Jesus. Again, no man knows the day or the hour. Then we have Christ's return. And then the Bible speaks of what's known as the millennium, which is a thousand years of Christ ruling and reigning on the earth. We'll look at some of those scriptures tonight if I hurry up. And after the millennium, the thousand years, there'll be the final day of judgment, um, which, which we're not given a lot of detail of, but there is some description there in, in Revelation. So this is the main sort of area we'll be looking at this evening where the red arrow is, the time scale relative to, to the last days and Armageddon and Christ's return. If you want to put a rough BC calendar, um, we're talking about 4000 BC with the fall of Adam, 3000 BC and so on. So it just runs to a different time scale. Christ's first coming again, was it exactly zero AD? I doubt it. We've never really got all the time scales all that right anyway, but um, 31 AD, again, we don't know when Jesus is returning. Um, so the next slide. One of the keys to understanding Bible prophecy is to understand who the players are on God's great, in God's great plan and to be able to identify them amongst the nations today. That was something that Tom Foster particularly um, had, a, had a very clear vision about and was completely correct, by the way, also. Um, and that is really one of the things that makes our fellowship very, very unique in terms of the clarity of vision on the Pentecostal experience of personal salvation, water baptism, speaking in other tongues, this being filled with the Holy Spirit, but also an understanding of where the what God's plan was for the nations as it unfolded over the, the millennia to today. And so without going into the detail of it all, God's blessing on Abraham was passed to Isaac and then to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. He had 12 sons. Those sons became known as the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, Manasseh, the 13th tribe, we have represented the United States of America, Ephraim, the, the Great Britain and the Commonwealth of Nations. And again, in, a, in another talk, we'll go into the detail of what, what this all looks like. But there is so much modern day identification or markers that, that connect the lost 10 tribe house of Israel after it was taken into captivity by the Assyrians around 741 BC. And their migrations into the British Isles, and then of course, um, the, the colonization and the independence of the United States of America. So God said he'd make thy name great. Uh, great Britain, I don't know of any other country in modern terms that have great literally in their name, but Great Britain does. Possess the gates of his enemies was another promise God made to Abraham, and it certainly was a huge factor with the British Commonwealth in the First and the Second World Wars. We've got slides on that. God promised to Ephraim, to which we can trace the British Commonwealth peoples, in, in at least symbolically, a nation and a company of nations would come out of them, and that's certainly been the case there with the Commonwealth of, of Nations. Emblem of the lion and the unicorn, which we see in the coat of arms today. The seven times punishment, which I can't go into tonight, but is just fascinating in terms of a scaled prophetic message, uh, particularly with 1917 and the delivery of Jerusalem under General Allenby in the, um, the Middle East. Both the, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants not only can we identify the British Commonwealth of countries with the Ten House Tribe and the House of Ephraim, um, but also the also the um, the throne of David too, which we can't get into, but we we identify that with the British monarchy. Um, God said that they would inherit the desolate heritages, and um, there's 
certainly a fulfillment of that prophecy with the with the advance of the Commonwealth countries into places like Australia, which was relatively desolate and many others. Um, the last one I'll talk about on another day also, but Jesus said that he would take the kingdom of God would be taken from the Jews he was talking to and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And so throughout the years of the Reformation and the people of Great Britain becoming known as the people of the book, um, the the gospel really has seen freedom to to flourish in the Commonwealth countries in particular, not only, but in particular as you go through the history of the of the Reformation and the Protestant movement. This ties in the link to the House of David, to which Jesus is obviously through his mother Mary, a descendant of great of, of David. We sing in a hymn, Great David's greater son. But through David's other son, Solomon, we can trace the, the line of the kings of Judah down to Zedekiah in the Bible, um, the transference of that through Zedekiah's daughters and pro most probably prophet Jeremiah as well into Ireland, the Irish into the Scottish and Scot Scotland into, into England. And, and there, there you have the line of the the kings and queens of England with the, the British monarchy. And so when Jesus comes, he will come to rule and reign whose right it is, the Bible says, and take up the throne of his father David. What an understanding of these, this prophetic message brings is it brings into focus God's plan. What Jesus is returning for, why there'll be a battle of Armageddon, what the reasons are, and, and the clarity of 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 focus that you can have if you understand the overview, the simple message that's behind this is, is quite astonishing. So over the coming few months, we'll, we'll look into some more of this detail as we go through different slides. So the last days. We're in the last days now, and I would suggest to you we're in the last of the last days. When, when the Church of England's talking about trying to make God gender neutral, when we can't decide whether children are boys or girls, and, and we need to debate that. I even heard one person seriously trying to suggest that a mother should get consent from her baby before they, she changes her nappy. The world's gone mad, and, and there just can't be too much longer left. The world's gone mad. Um, and, and the Bible warns that this, this level of stupidity would occur. So whilst it is surprising, it shouldn't be. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this, they are willingly ignorant. <laughs> That's certainly the case in the, in the land that we're living in today. So here's some of the signs that the Bible puts out that, that would be particularly prevalent in the last days, the signs of the times that we, we refer to them as. One of them was that um, as it was in the days of Lot, so it would be in the, day, the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Lot was known for immorality, and we've taken immorality as a nation and particularly the Western world to whole new levels of filth, which, praise the Lord, he's delivered us out of. But there comes a, a great burden and weight of, of sin from the, that activity that, that bears down upon a society. Pride, fullness of bread, the abundance of idleness were all typified by Lot's time in Sodom and Gomorrah. As it was in the days of Noah, Noah's time was known for violence, and we're seeing increasing violence on a global scale. Earthquakes, and you've probably seen the, the catastrophic earthquakes in Turkey and Syria uh, recently. I think there was, last time I checked, 35,000 estimated dead. The magnitude and frequency of earthquakes is increasing. Just as the Bible warned it would, Jesus warned us of this. Famines. And, and all these things are often linked together. Um, famines in particular are driven by corruption and greed of mankind. The world's got plenty of food to feed the whole globe. 
and yet there are people starving to death. Pestilence, well, pestilence brought us a Zoom, but it brought a lot of other things too. I'll refer to COVID-19 there, of course, but um, all kinds of pestilences that have hit farmers and, and society. God said, and I think it was in the book of Daniel, it increased knowledge. And there's certainly been an exponential explosion in knowledge. And now we're talking about artificial intelligence. Chat, I don't know if you've seen that, chat GP. Um, the, the rise of AI will most likely see the continued exponential growth of knowledge. And yet as a race of people, as a, as a people of the earth, I don't think the mankind's ever been dumber. Like I say, to be to be debating some of the things that they're debating at the moment beggars belief. And yet there's increased knowledge. Wars, all those boxes are ticked. And there are others in, um, also related to the environmental impact and the collapse of economic systems. God warned that they throw their Gold and their silver to the moles and the bats. That, those days are coming. There are specific um, prophecies in some of the minor prophets that are of particular note. One here, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as a garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing shall escape. Um, and, and some of the machines of modern warfare that have been sending tanks now into Ukraine to fight against the Russians which the Russians are starting to voice their opinion that it is an act of aggression and war from NATO supplying these, these equipments into, into Ukraine. That situation is volatile beyond belief with sabre-rattling regarding the use of nuclear weapons happening also. Okay, the, the world's becoming numb to it because we hear it all the time. The Bible warned us this was the last days. These would be the signs of the times. Neither is there any end to their chariots. I think that's an interesting one. We've got fairly advanced chariots these days, but there's no end to them. Um, they shall seem like torches. They shall run like lightnings, we read in the book of Nahum. So there are many prophecies that, that are of particular note that identify that God knows the end from the beginning. God exists outside of the timeline, time scale we're living in. He knows the end from the beginning and he's given us an overview so that when these events start to unfold, we are not caught by surprise. There's astonishing um, prophecies in the book of Revelation about the, the rise of Islam. The, the rise of the Islamic religion was particularly a curse that God allowed to unfold against paganized Christianity. Um, we, in, in Revelation 19, it speaks about the, the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as a smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And, and as you read on, it gives you a very clear, crystal clear description of the, of the rise of Muhammad and, and the Islamic uh, faith. Um, in, in Revelation 9, it speaks of the fifth trumpet and the first woe, one and the same things. And it was a five month, I won't go into the time scales here, um, the, the prophetic months there, but it particularly outlined the rise of the Mohammed um, and their conquests um, against paganized Christianity uh, in its beginning. The sixth trumpet or the second woe, speaks of the rise of the Turkish Islamic conquests, again, against paganized Christianity. And we've seen a resurgence, particularly it's died down over recent times, but of Islamic-based terrorism. Um, and, and as the hypocrisy of the Western so-called Christian world increases, so with it, you get the rise of resistance from the Islamic world. That's nothing new. And it's in line with Bible prophecy. The seventh trumpet of, of the third woe um, is the prophecies there about the Battle of Armageddon. But it's quite fascinating to see the prophecies 
that, that God gave of the rise of, of the Islamic faith. And I'm not suggesting they are totally to blame. Israel is certainly a protagonist in the conflict that exists there. But God did warn that um, the squabble over Jerusalem in particular would be the, one of the key factors in the outbreak of the Battle of Armageddon. And, and that's a whole other talk all in itself also. Church of Rome is given a lot of play in, in the book of Revelation. And, and really, the descriptions given of the Church of Rome um, kicked off the Reformation as people got copies of the Bible in their own language. They could read it and clearly identify that it was talking about the Church of Rome, the Seven Hills, etc. cetera. Um, but the prophecy of the Bible is that that, that great city of Babylon, which, which we identify there with modern-day Rome, in one hour their judgment is come. Um, so, again, that could indicate a, a time where, where um, a bomb of large proportion is dropped right on there at, at Vatican City. Um, that's really what that kind of indicates. And again, I can't go into the detail of all that. In fact, I've, I've left out all the other slides about Rome. The Bible talks in detail about Russia. Okay. All, all I'm doing is giving you an overview. We'll get into the detail of this in other talks. Otherwise, we would be here all night. I'm watching the clock. I've got a countdown timer on. And I'm also glancing to see how many people are sleeping, by the way. Um, so far, we're doing okay. <laughs> I think. Um, Russia. The chapters in Ezekiel 38 and 39 are often referred to as the Russian chapters of the Bible. Um, and not just by us, by the way. Not just by us. Son of man, set thy face against Gog in the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against them. And even in the original Hebrew that, that was written in, the chief prince should be translated as Rosh, Prince of Meshach and Tubal, which it would we would consider is probably the root original words for um, Moscow and Tobolsk there in Russia. The Bible identifies modern day nations all the way back in ancient times from Britain and the Commonwealth countries to America, to the rise of Islam, to the involvement of Rome. The, the, the Roman Catholic Church, as we know it today, is a pagan religion that was simply given Christian names. And it's just as pagan now as it was then, rebranded. They just did a good job of rebranding. Um, right, we'll move on. I've got a few slides on Russia. Here's a very old map. Rosh, Rus, um, Tubal, Tubolsk, the land of Magog. Now, when you look at the history of the Russian and the Assyrian people from which Russia derives, the Ukraine was their land. <laughs> I know we, we view it in modern day terms and we say it's horrific that they've invaded Ukraine. And it is, it violates international law. But that's not necessarily how the old guard in Russia see it. Ukraine, as far as they're concerned, was just as big a part of Russia as any, as Russia itself. Um, so the histories are interwoven. Bible also identifies allied with Russia, Libya, Persia or Iran. Um, and, and a couple of others we'll look at in a moment. Prophecies here say, Thou, Rosh, Russia, shall come from thy place out of the north parts. And, and Russia is that great northern confederacy. Thou shall come against the mountains of Israel, which have been laid waste. And particularly if you come from the north down into the land of Palestine, you come in over, over the West Bank through the mountains of Israel um, that have been laid waste. And the description here of Israel, bought back from the sword, certainly true of Jerusalem, gathered out of many people. Well, after the Balfour Declaration, after the First World War, 1917, 
um, the Jews assembled there in Jerusalem and it was assigned as a national home for the Jews, brought forth out of the nations. And the warning that's given in Ezekiel is that Persia, Ethiopia and Libya with the Russians and many people with thee. And the warning given is when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And um, that's certainly the direction that that is already going and will continue to go in the future. So these mysteries of Bible prophecy are hidden from many, but in our fellowship have been known for decades. And praise the Lord for faithful men like Pastor Jock, who have seen the need, the necessity and the and, and the importance of ensuring that this vision that the church was given, um, particularly as the revival movement started, is not lost, especially in the last days, now more than ever. And so we've got resources like this and we can come around the word and have a look at it. This is always a scary one for us Canadians as far as I'm concerned. All right for Ron and Francis down in Florida. But the prophecy here, it says of the Russians, they will say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I think that's a perfect description of Canada. Um, <laughs> um, I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. And that's certainly the environment of the Canadian and the United States of America, the people, you know, um, certainly not in fortified dwellings. Most of us anyway. There are some in Florida that I wonder about, but that's another story too. Um, if you look at the, the globe from the pole, if Russia was to go up, they're already in the north. Um, there's an area across somewhere through, where is it, the Bering Strait, where over winter you could walk between Russia and America. Um, and Russia has invested billions of dollars in its Arctic um, military stations up there in that region also. All these chess, it's like a big game of chess that no one's paying attention to that fits perfectly along with Bible prophecy. That will bring us to the Battle of Armageddon. Again, I hope you can appreciate, I can only do sort of big picture stuff when I'm covering such a, such a wide expanse of time. But the Bible warns that he gathered them together into the place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. There's many scriptures that describe the fallouts and the effects and the details of Armageddon. Um, I'm not going to read that scripture for now. Uh, I'm just going to keep going just for the sake of time or I'm going to run out. In Jeremiah 25, thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day. From one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, they shall not be lamented, nor gathered, nor buried. They shall be done upon the ground. The, these times are coming upon the human race. And we're not a doomsday cult, as it were, but the warnings that scientists are given, the, the doomsday clock being moved closer, people without any idea of what God said would happen with Bible prophecy, a warning of this, even if it's not just from a um, resource and an environmental point of view. Interesting verse in, in Amos here, which I won't go into too much detail. When Jacob had his dream on the stone, he promised to give back to God one-tenth. One-tenth is what of, of everything God gave him. Well, God gave to Jacob Israel the nation of the peoples of Israel, which we've identified here in, as the Anglo-Saxon Celtic peoples of the earth. This prophecy in Amos says, Hear ye this word which I take up against you, a lamentation, O house of Israel. The virgin of Israel is fallen, she shall no more rise, she is forsaken upon her land, there is none to raise her up. For thus saith the Lord God, the city that went out by a thousand 
shall leave an hundred. That's only a tenth left. And that which went forth by an hundred shall leave ten to the house of Israel. So the, the catastrophe that is coming upon, especially the nation of Israel, is unprecedented. And for a long time, the revival movement encompassing all of it have been warning people, teaching people. These, this is not something I've made up. This has been known and preached and understood for decades going all the way back to at least 1940s in Australia. God said of the Russian people and those that were allied with her, I will turn thee back and leave but a sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land. That's a lot of dead bodies. I don't want to get too sombre, but this is the path forward, which should reinforce just how precious our salvation is, our fellowship is, our union, unity in the spirit, and the vision God gives us to keep us safe. Because all this stuff is going to come into play in a big way when it starts unfolding. And our knowledge of these events and the guidance of the spirit is, is all that we will have to rely on to keep us safe. And of course, the power of God yeah, is, as part of that. In Luke chapter 21, there should be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which have come upon the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. In the original Greek, there could even be a reference there. There's certainly overlap um, with, with uh, original Greek words that we have, have used and translated into nuclear power also. That's another story. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming with a cloud with power and great glory. And that's what we're looking forward to. After the battle of Armageddon, it would appear again that God will judge the earth because there are scriptures that say that God will arise to shake terribly the earth himself. And, and some of the descriptions given of the, the geographical upheaval, particularly there in the Middle East with the Dead Sea and the direction of, of the waters that are flowing there, again, prophecies I can't go into tonight, um, certainly support this, as do some of the description in revelations of, of hailstones the size of VWs and so on. Um, a scary time. I believe during God's judgment on the earth, albeit most likely short, the saints will have already been risen to meet Christ in the air at this time. And there are scriptures that, that refer to that too. Revelation 16. Then every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. The plague thereof was exceeding great. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And the effects of both nuclear and geological upheaval result in the crystallization of sand into glass. Literally, it melts in the elemental level. The earth also and the works that are in there shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So it puts it back on our testimony that, that the Lord's given us a great vision. What, ought, what manner of persons ought we to be? Hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. It's repeated in more than one place in the Bible. There shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. This was in Matthew 24. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. God will intervene. He will shorten the madness of man and his war on the earth. Um, I believe God's shortening these days will be an answer to the prayer of the church. 
also. And I refer to some scriptures in the, the book of Joel that ties in with that. But for the elect's sake, that's the church, those days shall be shortened. So man's madness on the earth will be limited. Otherwise, as scientists have pointed out, he will destroy himself off the face of the earth. And then Christ will come back. And that's where we'll certainly be having a sigh of relief. That's where it gets good, real good. Uh, for the Lord's people, he's faithful, he's chosen. Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. This is in Revelation, talking about Jesus. Nearly finished. I've only got three more slides left. Acts chapter 1. These were the angels that said this. You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This is when Jesus ascended back up into heaven to sit on the right hand of his father. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, Jesus ascended up into heaven from the Mount of Olives. And just as he went up, he's going to come back. And his feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives. And the Bible also gives us the specifics that the Mount of Olives will split in half. And interesting enough, geologists have studied the Mount of Olives and have found a fault line that runs right under the middle of that mountain. Incredible. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And this is in the book of Zechariah, written before Jesus even came the first time. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And that's the exact nature of the geological fault line that runs under the Mount of Olives. And there shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall be removed towards the north and half of it towards the south. Behold, he comes with clouds. Every eye shall see him. They also, we read that earlier. Should have taken that one out. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. I saw something in this verse recently that amazed me, and I want to point it out. The way that he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. I always considered this to be a dictatorship. <laughs> rod of iron, you know. But when I looked at the Greek recently of this verse, that word rule means to tend as a shepherd. That's what that word rule means. Our great shepherd is coming back to shepherd, most likely the tenth of Israel or thereabouts, that have been so humbled by the events of the Battle of Armageddon and God's judgment that they'll cry to God, as we read in the book of Isaiah, let us go up into the house of the Lord that he might teach us of his ways. And, and the church is called to form part of that government of Christ on the earth when he returns. It's incredible how it all ties in together. I'm nearly done. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Well, this hasn't happened yet. Upon the throne of David, it ties it back in. Christ's return to the throne of David and the ties that we can see historically in through with the British monarchy. He's coming to sit upon the throne of David. So the throne of David's got to be in the earth today for him to come back to. And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's going to happen. Second to last slide. That's ground zero. That's the Mount of Olives, just to give you a visual. I'm sure by the time all this is over, it's going to look a lot different. I see Sister Francis there with your phone. I will. I can send you a copy of this if you'd like. No problem. <laughs> right. Last slide. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That's the saints. Those that are called to meet the Lord in the air. Spirit-filled, called, chosen and faithful. On such the second death hath no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's the millennium, a period of a thousand years after Christ's return. 
And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Again, there's a lot of detail in Revelation. I just can't even mention it or I'll get in more trouble for going over. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. This is in the, the mouth of the saints and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and the nobles with fetter of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, this honour have all his saints, praise you the Lord. Now, again, I can't go into all the original Hebrew wording and all that, but the point is the church will form the government, part of the government of Christ on the earth. So that's all the slides. <laughs> I did go a little bit longer than half an hour, granted. Sorry. But that was as quick as I could get through that. Um, we'll take off smaller chunks on the next meetings going forward. So 